Hello, you're listening to the Watchman's Cry News from the Wall and the Issues of Life, the program that visits world events and the issues that affect God's people in these end times. Hello, my friends. You're listening to the Watchman's Cry News from the Wall and the Issues of Life. I'm Nathan Leal, and the website is watchmanscry.com. And today, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to be bringing you a word that the Lord gave to me as I was seeking Him and praying. And the reason that the Lord gave this to me is because of what's happening right now in present-time America and in present-time 2020. This year has started with a bang. The drums of war are beating on the doorstep of America And when I saw what happened the other day when Iran started to bomb the bases in Iraq, my heart felt so grieved. I was very sad because a lot of people who don't know God are going to suffer great things. And when I saw the news of the bombing, I called up Allison in Berlin and she was asleep and I woke her up and I told her about it. And uh, I said, Allison, we need to pray. So when we started praying, all we really did was weep. I wept and she wept and We cried out to God and we just asked him for his mercy. We asked him for more time. We asked him to protect our children because I have children that are at that age that could be drafted. So does she. I know a lot of you have children who are at that age. Now, while some people may say, Nathan, what are you worried about? No war is coming or the draft's not coming. You know, folks, the events taking place right now are going to lead to chaos. They're going to lead to catastrophe. They are going to lead to a major war. A major war is eventually going to come where we face off with Iran, with Russia, China, and other opponents. So over the last few days, I've been seeking God about this, and he gave me a message. And I want to just share with you the challenges that that you're going to face, that your families are going to face, your children. And it's not just Christians. All of America is going to face this. And in fact, the whole world's going to face this. So I want to ask for your undivided attention and to Just find a place where you can sit down and hear these words because I share them from my heart, a heart of grief, a heart of sorrow. You know, some people have asked me and they've said, Nathan, if you're a a watchman and you know these things are coming, why do you get upset or sad when you see them coming? And folks, I don't know how to explain it. I don't know how to explain it. I've heard the cries, folks. I've heard the pain. I've heard the, the groans, the wails, the grief saw the faces of people who were standing in line when America was occupied. I've seen the faces of those who are afraid. God has allowed me to experience what it feels like and what it's going to feel like when these things come. And folks, I I don't want, I don't look forward to it. And seeing them get closer and closer just breaks my heart because I know how hard it's going to be for a lot of people. I have loved ones and I know how how hard it's going to be for them and for you. And for my loved ones. So uh, I come to you very heavy hearted today. And so I just ask that you would listen to this message and take the matter to prayer. I'm going to share some spiritual challenges and I'm also going to share a message of hope. So uh, please take the time to listen to this and and share it with your loved ones. And uh, if you appreciate this message and this ministry, then I appreciate your support. The address is Watchman's Cry, P.O. Box 157, Priest River, Idaho, 83856. Or you can go to the website at watchmanscry.com and contact us there. I want to open up with a word of prayer and then I'm going to share this message. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to speak to your children I thank you for the opportunity to share with them words from you and words to challenge them and words to encourage them. And Father, I pray that you would touch every heart and every life and that you would help those, God, that are struggling, help those that are hurting, help those who are not doing so well, help those who are struggling in their faith, in their Christian walk. Help them, God. And I pray that this message would encourage those who are struggling And those who are carrying heavy weights would cry out to you and grow closer to you and seek you. And God, touch them as they do. Lift their burdens. 
give them peace, and God, let your loving kindness and your mercies be upon them as they cry out to you in repentance. And I thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen. Ladies and gentlemen, a new chapter of time has begun. It's 2020. It's a new decade. And mark it down, folks. This year is going to be a year to remember. And it's going to be recorded as the season when America's nightmare arrived as she went further into the night and suffered loss. Loss is coming. America's parade of greatness is going to morph into a funeral procession of grieving widows and fatherless children. And across the land, a scene is going to be replayed over and over as her song becomes a lonely trumpet, weeping taps in the rain. My friends, sunset is upon us, and darkness awaits, and a destroyer is perched outside the city, anticipating their instructions to break America's toys and make grown men cry. And for this I grieve, because war is arriving. It's coming, folks. The nation crossed a bridge, and there's no going back. And if you're awake, you're probably grieving with me. I've received messages from some of you, and some of you are grieving as well. Because you understand what these words mean. And you also understand what time it is. And you also understand that there are songs like the Ballad of Job waiting to be played for many people. You know, I remember as a young Christian reading the Bible and learning about the term birth pangs. Most of you know the phrase birth pangs. You've, you've heard it. Pastors have talked about it. A lot of sermons have been shared about birth pangs. And in Matthew 24, verse 8, Jesus talked about them. And most Christians are familiar with the term, and according to the Bible that you have, your Bible translation will say that term a number of ways. The New American Standard Bible reads, but all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. In the King James Version, it reads, all these things are the beginning of sorrows. Have you noticed that sometimes it's sorrows and sometimes it's birth pangs? Well, I want to talk about that phrase. The Greek originates in a word called odin, which means the pain of childbirth, travail, birth pangs, intolerable anguish, sorrow. It means a number of things. And when Jesus gave that sermon, the Olivet Discourse about the end of time, he warned about several categorical topics that were going to come to earth. And then he mentioned birth pangs. He mentioned birth pangs in Matthew 24, verse 8. But in the verses before that, he warned about deception and wars and rumors of wars and kingdoms fighting against kingdoms famines, pestilence, and earthquakes. And then after that list of horrible things that we were going to be challenged with, he said, all of these things are the beginning of the birth pangs, of sorrow, of travail. My friends, this season has now arrived. And as Christians, we need to really get a hold of an understanding about this season so that we're not thrown into the wind when we face the turbulent weather that's ahead. I mentioned a moment ago that I used to read about Matthew 24 and the birth pangs, and I read about it a lot. I read it over and over because I wanted to understand the end times. And now when I look back, I never really thought about the season of birth pangs. Back then, I didn't. I never really thought about what they would look like. And over the years, I've noticed that Christians often talk about them, you know, they'll mention the time of sorrows or the birth pangs, but most Christians really don't consider the details of them either. And back then, I knew that birth pangs was a biblical term, but until recently, I didn't really think about what they would look like, their appearance. Because Jesus said these are the beginnings of birth pangs. So do birth pangs have an appearance, folks? Indeed, they do. Because Jesus was not just reciting poetry. He was describing a spiritual phenomenon that would manifest in the end times. And he called it birth pangs. And you know, folks, over the years, how many Christians knew that birth pangs also meant that there would be a season of time when the earth would experience delirium in the physical realm as well as the spiritual realm? 
How many people knew that the birth pang phenomena would include a manifestation where the earth actually shakes along with the heavens? And how many knew that birth pangs would also shake the hearts of men? Never really thought about it. Did you, my friend? In the natural, birth pangs mean pain. And for those of you who have experienced it, whether it was you or or your spouse, a relative or friend, many of you are familiar with what happens when a woman gives birth and the pain that they go through and the birth pangs, etc. You know, because in the natural, birth pangs mean pain. They mean screams and agony, distress and clenched teeth and groans of affliction. And as a young Christian, when I studied the Bible, I never realized that someday I would observe a season of time that goes through that same sort of intense physical and emotional stress. I never thought that I would be living in a season of time where the world's going through that. Nor did I realize that birth pangs would charge the atmosphere with distress and a dark cloud of oppression that a lot of people would feel. It's in the air. You notice that it's not the same anymore, is it, folks? The atmosphere around us is no longer the same. No matter where you go, there's a coldness that has come over the land. Have you felt it, folks? It's cold. There's a spiritual coldness where the joy and the peace that used to be on the faces and the countenance of people is no longer to be found. So birth pangs have brought this. Jesus said, in the time of the end, these things are the beginnings of birth pangs and sorrow. And I never thought that when we got to this chapter of time that we'd be able to feel it like this. You know what else? I don't like it. I don't like it because I see what it's doing to people, but it's still here. It's in the air, folks. It's in both the spiritual atmosphere and also in the physical realm. It's here, folks. And it gets worse. Because the birth pangs of this planet have had an effect on people. It's causing people to deteriorate in their goodness. Whatever goodness they might have had in the past, it's causing it to evaporate from men's souls and from their hearts. And the pangs have caused people to vomit their inner darkness onto the ground. And these birth pangs are going to bring trials and tribulation to a lot of people. And already there are a lot of people facing trials and tribulation and heartache and pain and sorrow. Already in this new decade, it's already happening to a lot of folks. But that's because this is where we are in the time of birth pangs. Those trials will be in our path. They will be in your path. Some of you aren't facing them yet, but they are coming. You know, folks, trials have a way of crushing our flesh into powder and causing us to cry out to God. But that doesn't happen for everybody. Because for some folks, trials have a way of doing the opposite, which is to make them bitter because they're laden down with sin and they don't want to repent. They just don't want to. But folks, ladies and gentlemen, my friends, to those who are listening, repent. We must. We have to. Because without repentance, we will not have a relationship with God. And without repentance, we will not have a way to communicate with God because our sins have separated us from God. When we have sin in our lives, it separates us from God. So if you need help, as we go into this darkness of trials and tribulation and all these other distressful things, and we're going to need God, folks. We are. You're going to need God. No matter where you are, no matter how rich you are, no matter how famous you are or important you are, you're going to need God. We all do. Because there's no way that we're going to endure this without Him. And if we don't repent, the residue of sin is going to remain inside. And folks, it's dangerous to harbor sin because sin is toxic to the soul and it's malignant to the spirit. Sin is a cancer and it damages the body in so many ways. It does, folks. The iniquity of man is a poisonous mixture of gall and guano that is poisoning the land. Iniquity does that. It poisons the land and as it spills out of humans, it etches itself into the earth. Because of that, birth pangs are also affecting the earth. And they're going to gyrate the earth with a groan. 
and they're going to make the earth shake. Now, in the natural, when a woman gives birth, the birth pangs arrive in waves and cause her body to have contractions. Most of you know this. And when the woman is experiencing the contractions, they cause trauma, both emotional and physical. And depending on the person, depending on the woman, depending on where she is, whether she's ready or emotionally capable, depending on whether she's tired or feeling weak or strong, depending on where they are, most of the uh, contractions will cause trauma, both emotional and physical. And for some women, they experience hysteria and frenzy and agitation. Some of you feel that? The dread? You remember that, ladies? The tension, the anxiety, the, the panic? Because you didn't know if you could do it? After the first contractions, it was you were asking yourself, how in the world are you going to be able to do this for hours and hours? Some of you asked yourself and questioned, how, how are you going to be able to endure it for hours? Because it was so intense. And that's what birth pangs are. They are intense. They bring anxiety and panic and loss of confidence and apprehension and so many more things, so much more. And in the same manner, the Bible tells us that in the time of the end, the earth is going to experience these things. The season would arrive with these things. And when Jesus was telling us that war would come, he was also telling us that as, as the war arrived, the ground was going to shake and quake as the hooves of the invading horsemen blitzed over the land. Folks, we must prepare for this. Because birth pangs are going to burn the forest and paint the sky with smoke. And they are, folks. They're also going to roar in the sea and push waves over the land and overtake the shores. This is going to happen, folks. It's already beginning. The birth pangs are going to gyrate the earth and cast grown men onto the ground. And the birth pangs will also do something else because Jesus had a list. He mentioned deception and charlatans who were going to take advantage of God's people. And when the birth pangs come, they're also going to throw a yoke upon men and turn their hearts to stone. And unfortunately, a portion of God's people are going to buckle under the weight and they're going to quit. But as God's child, my friend, you must be strong. You must be determined for Jesus. And no matter what happens, you must resist the temptation to succumb as you travel through the night. And if Jesus lives in you, God has called you, you, to be an overcomer. So don't lose your faith, my friend. No matter what happens around you, your face must be set like flint towards the heavenly city, towards the heavenly country whose builder and maker is God. Folks, every one of you have loved ones who have gone on ahead before you, and they're waiting. They're cheering for you to get to the prize. They're cheering for you to continue in the narrow road. They're cheering for you to be able to be an overcomer and to stand and not fall. Or if you do fall, to get back up. Ladies and gentlemen, I have to say these words because the birth pangs are, they're becoming worse. And the earth is going to start shaking violently pretty soon. Sadly, most people don't know how difficult it's going to be to maintain balance as hell's undertow takes the land into convulsions. So you got to stand, my friend. You must stand, no matter how challenging it gets. I must also warn about something else. Jesus said that the birth pangs would bring deception. As I look around, I can see it arriving. How many of you folks can see it? It's there. It's arriving, and I can also see what it's going to do. Therefore, I have to talk about it, and I have to warn about it. Because birth pangs also bring fog. A fog, a mist. It makes it hard to see. It's a spiritual mist. You know when you're in regular fog and you're driving your car and you turn on your brights and then you turn them off and you're just trying to get a better vantage point and you're hoping that it would work, but no matter how hard you try, that fog is just there. And while you're in it, you're in it and you know you're in it and you can feel it and see it. Well, this also goes for the spiritual realm, the invisible realm. And in the invisible realm, there is a fog that has arrived with the time of sorrows and with the birth pangs. And that fog is a nighttime cloud that infects it's infecting some folks with blindness as the sea of judgment pounds the shore it is folks it's blinding people so make note ladies and gentlemen that's the other thing i just mentioned a sea of judgment 
pounding the shore. And the reason I do that is because I've had several prophetic visions and dreams of tsunamis coming over land. And I saw them happen when I was on the East Coast. I've seen them happen when I was in the Gulf Coast. And every time I've seen it, the waters were very high. And just recently, about two weeks ago, I had another prophetic glimpse of the waves. The waves roaring and in this particular prophetic glimpse, I was in the water. I was about 100 feet offshore, just treading water. And the waves, instead of going inward to the shore, turned backwards. And they started flowing out to sea. And I was about 100, maybe, well, maybe it was about 100 to 150 feet from shore. But from the shoreline where the water is turns into land, into dry ground, the tsunami started there. And it built up about maybe... 30 feet, and then it went outward into the horizon, and it went out further and further. And in the dream, I uh, I found it very odd because I was thinking, why would the waves go backwards? That's weird. But it did. It it went until I couldn't see them anymore, and all the water went away. And you know, you've seen those pictures when the water recedes and retracts right before a tsunami arrives. Well, that's what happened. And then in the distance, I saw the waves that had left. They stopped moving, and they met with the waters in the horizon and then it turned around and started coming toward the shore but it was several miles away and it started growing taller and taller and taller and the tsunami wave was huge folks it was uh, 50 100 feet high but it was still far in the distance and then my dream was over and uh, when i woke up i i sought god about that and what i have uh, determined is that we're in a season where the waves are gathering And there are things that are being taken out to sea. The regular things that are around us are going to be taken out to sea and then become part of the flood that comes back in and just floods everything. And when it does return, it's not necessarily just a physical tsunami. In fact, I don't believe at this point in time that it's telling me that a tsunami is going to come. Instead, I see it as a spiritual thing. A spiritual flood is coming, folks. But it's not from the good side. It's going to be a spiritual flood from hell, from darkness, from our enemy. So that's why I have to warn about this. Jesus said the the birth pangs would bring deception. And as I look around, it's here. There's a deception. And these deceptive events are going to come in waves. And then they will pound our lives or the uh, area around us. And then they will subside and go away. And then there's going to be another one right after. And these waves will come in a measured cadence where they'll hit, they'll arrive. And then there'll be a gasp and a shock. And then there'll be another one to come in. And between the two, I don't know how, there will be a span of time that is determined by God. But these waves of judgment and waves of deception are arriving now, folks. And when it does, we need to be very vigilant. And we need to be careful that we are not falling for the spell that comes with the judging wave. Because when the waves come, they're going to have this sudsy lather, you know, If you've been to the shoreline, it gets kind of lathery and sudsy, like suds and bubbles. In the same way, the tsunami of judgment, as it comes, is going to be a lather from hell. It's going to be a a foam that will suffocate people with trials and turbulence. And it's not going to care who you are. It's not going to care who anybody is. No matter how rich they are, important, it doesn't care. It's going to target the young as well as the old. And as it arrives... It's going to clutter the mind of evangelicals and progressives. And it's going to entangle patriots with pandemonium. And it's going to mystify the mainstream and muddle the masses. And it's going to unseat men's hearts and minds. You know why, folks? Because it has an assignment. It does. Judgment has an assignment. And this lather from hell as it comes on the shore, is going to seek the dry places of men's hearts. And as that flows over the land, it's going to soak the parched ground of America and sprinkle it with counterfeit, with things that look nice and good and sweet. It's going to sprinkle it with sugar plums and candy that looks good, but actually is a counterfeit from hell. So we got to be on our best guard, folks. We have to have our strongest guard around us. We have to be able to see through the mind of Christ. And through the eyes of God, through the eyes of Jesus. We have to be aware that as these events arrive, we can't succumb to them. And I'm talking about deception. 
I'm talking about false Christ. I'm talking about people who show up and say they have a message and their whole reason for having it is to lead people astray. Sadly, some of the ones who are doing this don't even know they're deceived. They are deceived and are being deceived. That's what the Bible says during perilous times. So this thing is going to arrive as part of the birth pangs. Because Jesus said in his list, deception, many will be deceived. Many. That's part of the list of the birth pangs, the beginning of sorrows. Deception. So if deception's coming, what does it look like in the spiritual realm? Well, that's what I'm describing right now. It's going to be a tsunami of deception with foamy lather from hell that's going to seek the dry places of men who do not have the word of God in their heart. And it also does something else, folks. When people who are Christians are not where they're supposed to be with God or maybe they're not praying as much or, or worshiping as much or reading the Bible as much so they feel dry inside, there is a tendency at times for that dryness and that dry feeling to be Many times Christians who are in that place, in that situation, do not like feeling dry, unfortunately. Often they become victims of deception themselves, and they are presented with a false version of the gospel that is not what Jesus said, and it's not what Paul said, but it's a, a counterfeit version to try to either dilute the blood of Christ or dilute the word of God or dilute or a method of relationship with them, which is repentance. And these things do show up, and people have a tendency to maybe think that the reason that they're not feeling good or dry is because maybe they need to add something they haven't thought about, and this is how deception happens, because deception seeks out unwilling participants and people who don't know they're sick and people who don't know they have dry mouth. And it will offer a quenching drink to those who are thirsty but my friends be warned the drink from deception is a secretion from the bowels of the underworld and it'll burn your throat with bitterness and poison your soul this is why it's so important to be planted like a tree by god's river of righteousness and his water of life this is why it's vital to be camped by his well and hydrated by him by god so, my friends, as we go into this season of birth pangs, this is why it's so important. It's so, so important to be full of God. Because if we're empty, a lot of folks who are empty get taken advantage of. My friends, these are not just words I'm sharing. We must be full of the water of God. But sadly, the souls of a lot of Christians are parched, folks. And they're not partaking of his well. And as a result, they're dehydrated. They're empty. And what about you, my friend? Are you dehydrated? Are you? Does it feel empty inside of you? Within you? Does it feel like even though you're a Christian, there's something missing? Is there? And how many people of God are suffering from dryness of soul? How many? How many of the redeemed ones forgot to take a drink? And how many of those who knelt at the cross and are trying to look for his return, are dying of thirst. How many? And worse, how many have tried to take up the cross, but have also sought a drink from rancid vinegar, soaked in unrighteous rags? When Jesus was on the cross, he said, I thirst. He was dehydrated. He had bled. A lot of his blood had left his body and dripped out from the open wounds. He had bled from that. He bled from the whip. You know, they whipped him, folks. They whipped him and turned his flesh into hanging ribbons. But he endured it for us. And when he was hanging on the cross, Jesus said, I'm thirsty. So a, a Roman soldier took a reed and stuck a sponge on the end of it and dipped it in rancid vinegar into gall and lifted it to the lips of Jesus. That seems mean, doesn't it? That seems like torture when a person is dying to do that to them. But amazingly, Jesus drank it. Why did he do that? Why would Jesus take a sip of it? Well, folks, he did it so that we wouldn't have to. And he did it so that he could then offer you and me a drink from the water of life, from his well. He has water that heals, folks. 
the water from the well of Jesus refreshes and it heals and it turns a man who is parched and weary and a woman who is downcast, not self-assured. It can take those two people. It can take a man and a woman who is beat up, who feels worthless, and turn them into a warrior. we got to take a drink of this water regularly, folks. We must partake of his water regularly. We have to, because there are so many of you who are listening to me right now, and you know who you are. So many of you are parched. So that water from Jesus is what you need. That water from Jesus is the remedy. And that water during the time of sorrows is the only thing that's going to keep us refreshed, folks. The water of Jesus will bring life to your dry bones. This is why the Bible tells us to plant ourselves by the river, rivers of life. Because if we don't, if we don't, my friend, if you don't tap into God in your spiritual walk, you're going to dry up and become a carcass. Don't be a carcass, my friend. And don't lie in a slumber. The Bible says, Awake, sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine upon you. And that is the admonition for all of us today, for us to awaken and allow his light to shine down upon us. You know, folks, I I know that for many of you, it's hard out there. I do. Because we're living in the times of sorrow and I myself, I know, I know what sorrow is. I know. I know the pain of being alone. I know the pain of feeling like nobody cares. I know it, folks. And a lot of you are going through that as well. And Jesus knows it. He knows that some of you are going through the hardest challenge of your life. He knows that some of you are are burdened down with so many trials and tribulations. He knows. He knows that many of you are tired, tired and weary. But my friend, we have to fight this slumber. We have to. Don't be a slumbering saint. Because if you are, the buzzards from hell are going to mistake you for a carcass and land on you and (laughs) they'll peck on you. They'll try to peck out your eyes. And we don't want that, folks, because that would hurt. I know that sounds crazy. I know it sounds gross, but my point is we need to make sure we are hydrated with the water of God because perilous times are here. And it's so important that we, the chosen ones, the redeemed ones, the called out ones, partake of his water now. It's important that we do, folks. It's important that we fill our troughs now. It's important that our spirit is abounding with his abundance. That means you, folks. Your spirit must be overflowing and abounding with abundant life, with Jesus. We have to, my friend. We must. You must. So, for the sake of your spirit's health and for the sake of your endurance and your testimony and your witness, it's so important to tap into his well because otherwise the poisonous waters of perilous times and sorrow, the birth pangs, they're going to seek to kidnap you and carry you away into the night. We cannot have that. So folks, this is about your soul. This journey is about your soul. This journey that you are walking on, this journey of life on the road that you're on, it's about your soul. And guess what, my friend? Hell wants it. Hell wants your soul. Hell has opened its jaws and desires to swallow you deceive you and overwhelm you and convince you that you're worthless. But that's a lie. That's a lie, folks, because every human soul is priceless because God made it, which means God made you. And Jesus paid a price to redeem it. For you are his workmanship created by God for good works in Christ. And he wants to be your friend and be with you during these perilous times in the time of sorrows time of sorrows is here folks and perilous times are here the ways of judgment are approaching so get a hold of god get a hold of god today and seek him and if you might be harboring sin and not where you're supposed to be then let it go it's time to let it go confess your sins to him tell him you you don't want them in your life anymore tell him you're sorry for doing them tell him that you realize it 
because our Heavenly Father desires all His children to be in His hand and not out of fellowship, not walking in dryness, and not walking with harbored sin. So get a hold of God and let Jesus wash the mess that's inside and out. Because we're all in a mess, folks. We're all a mess. There is none righteous. No, not one. None of us. So let God's people come to the foot of the cross. Let God's people come to him and allow him to minister. Let all of God's people cry out to him for cleansing. Let's do this, folks. You know, when I saw the uh, that the bombing had started in Iran, and I know there's a drawdown right now. I know that, but eventually that drawdown is going to be reversed and something's going to happen. It could be done by a terrorist attack or, or something. Something's going to happen, folks. And when I saw the shelling occur, and I was talking about it on Facebook, some of my Facebook friends might remember this. There were some that mentioned that we need to have a solemn assembly. The people of God need to have a solemn assembly because we're there. And Folks, we don't need to be waiting until the bombs are landing to have a solemn assembly. We should be doing it now. Because, okay, if there's a drawback, a drawdown, and they're cooling down, and you know Trump doesn't want to hit them back yet, and Iran doesn't want to slap back yet, and so right now there's a lull. This is the time when we need to be having our solemn assembly, not after the missiles are falling. So I want to encourage all of you that are listening to become fully assured and do everything you need to do to become fully assured in your salvation. Make sure there's nothing that's separating you from God. Make sure there's nothing that's keeping you from him. If you have sin or you're harboring some things that you shouldn't have been doing, or if your life has been going in a direction that is not of God, my friend, now's the time to turn it around. And now is the time to stop it and then get full of God to get rehydrated with God. Folks, Jesus is just waiting. His mercies are there. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercy is new every morning and it reaches the clouds every morning. That comes from the book of Lamentations. It says that. Jeremiah wrote it. So may all of God's people become acquainted with the water of God and his wellspring of life as we journey and navigate through the time of sorrows. So my friend, Call out to him today. Call out to him. Let this be the day that strength returned. Let this be the day where the dryness went away. Make this the day. So many people have that thing. But God wants us to lay it down at the foot of the cross. So let's do that, folks. Let's do it. Because in the days that are ahead, the world is going to gyrate. And this planet is going to shake and quake and move and buckle under our feet. And we need to be strong, ladies and gentlemen. So I want to encourage all of you to take measures to nourish and strengthen your relationship with him. All right, folks. Well, this is the word that I wanted to share with all of you. And I'm going to say a prayer now. Heavenly Father, the world has gone mad. But you knew it was coming. You told us. So, Jesus, I pray that you would look down at every heart, every person listening right now, and Lord, touch them. There's a lot of people who are laden down with sin, and I ask for you to touch them as they repent and cry out to you. Let your love overshadow them. Let your arms comfort them, and your heavenly wings surround them. May your spirit envelop them, and your joy fill them, and your peace cover them. And I thank you, Lord. I thank you for doing this for them. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Well, folks, be blessed, be kept safe by the Spirit of God, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.